Good morning. Okay. My name is Jenny Bell Ruiz. Uh, today is uh, April 2, 2017. 2017, yeah. Um, this is, I'm in the Brownsville, Texas. Uh, interviewed Dr. Uh, Josh Arnaldo Cantu for the Voices Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Cantu, Arnoldo for agreeing to interview it by our project. Please know that if there are topics you don't wish to discuss, you will not have to discuss them. Also, if there are something you wish to discuss, we want to hear you. If at any point you wish to stop the camera to get a drink or use the facilities, please let us know. As we said early, your interview will mean at the Nady Lee Benson Library at the University of Texas at Austin campus. So let's begin. Okay, I don't know that you grew up. You grew up in San Juan. San Juan, Texas. San Juan, Texas. Could you tell me how it was growing in San Juan? San Juan was a small town. When I was growing up, it was maybe 2,600, 2,800 population. Small town. You. Everybody knew you or knew of you, you know, so it was, it was a very low-key growing up environment for me. So, but this is, San Juan is a border city. It's not quite on the border. It's probably eight or ten miles from the Rio Grande River. But there are other little towns closer to the border than San Juan. But we're real close. So, do you can you tell me? Could you tell me your experience in elementary school there? And everybody uh, speak Spanish there. I mean, how is the population? Can you describe <coughs> that? It's it's kind of it, back then when you were growing up, you didn't realize that there was a difference. That there was a. a a difference between the Anglo residents of San Juan and the Hispanic residents of San Juan. When I was growing up, people would make reference to El Pueblo Americano. And if you study the history of the valley a little bit, Jenny Bell, the railroad tracks were the dividing line. Mm -hmm. Most of the Anglo population when I was growing up lived on the south side of the railroad tracks and most of the Hispanic population lived on the north side of the railroad track. When you're young and growing up, you don't realize that, you don't recognize that, and you know, you're friends with everybody. I had Anglo friends growing up and Hispanic friends growing up, and you, you never really noticed that there was a difference. But it, it, was a, it was a good time to grow up. It was a good time to grow up. What do you mean? What, what does it mean, the Pueblo Americano? That's, that's how it was referred to, because south of the railroad tracks, it was mostly Anglo mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, living south of the railroad tracks. Not that you would go in and there was a sign that said, welcome to El Pueblo Americano. It was just the area known where the residents were primarily Anglo-American. On the north side of the railroad tracks, it was Hispanic-American. You told me in the preview form that your grandfather or grandmother came to the San Juan many years ago. They, my, my dad was the youngest of eight children. He was born in 1923, and he was the only son that was born on this side mm -hmm. of the river. His older sister, my aunt, would tell me stories about how they crossed the river in a cart being pulled by an ox, and that's, that's how they came to Texas. I don't think that there was immigration issues back then. I don't, I don't even know if immigration existed, you know, the, the border patrol. So they crossed and they came and they settled in San Juan. And 
<clears throat> having come across in a cart, you can imagine that they came across with nothing. And, it, and there's a story there because my granddad was very industrious, very, very hardworking man. And I saw that in his children, my uncles, they all had a very, very strong work ethic. A very united family. My uncles waited to get married until they were in their 30s, mid-30s. My dad got married the youngest, and he was, I think, almost 29 when he got married. So they all, they were all family-centered, focused on the family and helping out. They came across, my dad was born here in 23, in about 1950, about 25, 26 years after they came across, my granddad and my grandmother were selling some of their property to the church so they could build the church, the shrine of San Juan. And, and that, that is a story in and of itself, I think. You know, to come across with nothing in a cart being pulled by an ox and in a relatively short time, be in a situation where you can sell property to the church to build a shrine, you know, it tells me they were working hard, working real hard. But that's, that's the family, you know. So this is, so it's, your family is kind of a foundation in San Juan. Very and much. you grow up with this, all these stories, all your family. So this, as, as you say, the ethical work, hard work, it is, in, in your family mm -hmm. also. And <clears throat> you went to the high school also in San Juan? Yes, ma'am. How was this experience? Did you be aware more about where are you, like a well, Pueblo Americano in the high school? It, high school was, again, a good experience. Um, you made friends with everybody. And like everybody else, the friends you made in high school are still your friends. I, I see some of them every once in a while. and uh, You know, I, I can't say anything negative about my high school experience. It was, it was a good one. My teachers were great. They, they tried hard to teach me. And everybody was your friend. It was, it was a good time. So your family, I mean, you still have a big family. Did you have a big family? I had, I grew up with two sisters and three brothers. There was six of us. And everybody grew up in San Juan? Everybody grew up in San Juan. And when you have to go to the college, how they, everybody split, split out to go to the different college, well, or do you have an Jenny idea? Bell, we had, in Edinburgh, which is about 20 minutes away, we had Pan American which is now known as UTRGV, mm -hmm. U University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Yeah. Pan Am was a good school. My mom and my dad were both educators. I went into Pan Am as a pre-law major and graduated as an elementary ed teacher figure that one out. But my older sister graduated from Pan Am. I graduated from Pan Am. My younger sister graduated from Pan Am. All my brothers went to Pan Am. After, after the uh, bachelor's degree, you know, we were all presented with different opportunities and uh, some of us got higher degrees at other schools outside of the area, but primarily University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, which was known as Pan American at the time, was it. You know, that's where we went. They didn't have a lot of higher education degrees. I mean, they had a good school of education. You could get your bachelor's in education, go get a master's in education but they didn't have a doctoral program. So people would take off. Before we get to the 
the spirits of the college and the Pan American, and after that, your the Garcia, Ronaldo Garcia, Garza, Garza um, <clears throat> school. I want to talk about a little uh, why you go to the college first. Why you study? What you want to study? I understand your father was a educator, educator, and your mother also. Mm -hmm. And this the, the, the education. Oh, also, you have two daughters that has. I, have, a, I have two sons and two daughters. My oldest daughter became an attorney. My second daughter became an educator. My first son, which was our third child, became an attorney. And my fourth son, the second son, that my fourth child, is an educator. Yeah, so the education is a big value in your family, is the first question. And the second, you, you told me that you went, you become to a professor of the elementary school. Mm -hmm. I understand that it was so common in this area to people choose the, to be educator. I want to ask you if it was for, because everybody go there, I mean, everybody doing, or because you decided because it was a value in your family. I think the decision for me was in part based on the fact that my mom and my dad were educators. and that upbringing that I had was very focused on education and helping people also. And by the time I got to my junior year at, at college, I had already started going in that direction and I wanted to be an educator. I wanted to be in the classroom. I wanted to teach young children and you know help them out and help them grow. So I kind of steered my way into the education field and became a teacher. So you want to become a teacher in San Juan to educate in San Juan? I taught school in San Juan. I taught at a school that was actually walking distance from my home. Sometimes I would walk to work because it was like, you know, just not too far away. And about, I guess it was about five years after I started teaching. I had gotten married my third year of teaching. By my fourth year of teaching, I had a baby. And I was going, well, I, I, I was real concerned about, I had this urgency in me. It's like, how am I going to raise this child on a teacher's salary? And it's not that you can't do it, because a lot of teachers do, and they manage quite well. Me, I was just scared. I was like scared about the future and about how I'm going to do it. And <clears throat> My ex-wife hadn't started teaching yet. So I was on a one check, one, uh, one income family. So I, I left teaching and got a job with a construction company. And I stayed with that company for about four years. So you left the valley? I left the valley for a while. I, um, I came from San Juan to Brownsville. We lived here in Brownsville probably for about a year and a half, two years, and then I got promoted within the company and I ended up in, in Waco, Texas. And I, I was supposed to be in Waco for about a year, but after about three months, I got promoted and ended up in North Carolina. And I stayed in North Carolina, I think for a little bit more than a year. About that time, since we had been living in Brownsville and we moved, I had requested the Sunday edition of the Brownsville Herald be mailed to me. I had a Sunday subscription. And we were in North Carolina and I got the Sunday edition of the Brownsville Herald, but it was, you know, like a couple of days after it, it published and there was an article about a law school that was coming to Brownsville, Reinaldo Garza School of Law. And I remember telling my wife at the time, when we go back, I'm going to go to this school. 
and it, it worked out really well. Um, by the time we came back, the school had finished their first year in Brownsville, but they relocated to Edinburgh, which was about 20 minutes away from my home. And it was a night school. You had to apply. You had to take the LSAT. The dean, Dean DeMoss at the time, was very upfront. Everyone that applied had a sit down interview with the dean and he told you, we are not accredited. You can come to this school, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be able to take the bar exam. And you knew that up front. So there was a risk. And he told us, you know, we're trying to get accredited, but there's no guarantee. So all of the students at Reynaldo G. Garza School of Law were going to law school aware of the fact that after four years of studying the law, we might not be able to take the bar exam. And still, we persisted. Why? So it was, it was a, a gamble, it was a risk, but Jenny Bell, I, I think it's an indicator of the level of desire that the students had. You know, they wanted to learn the law. There was a lot of passion there. We wanted to learn. Why did, what did you decide before you tell me about this story? What, when do you decide, did you decide to be a lawyer? Because you were an educator. And after that, you become, uh, you, you say, I need to pay the check. I go to the, the construction stuff. You remember, and you, you were remember, there. You remember what I told you my major was when I first went to Pan Am? It was pre-law. I, I went in yeah. as a pre-law major. Right and got sidetracked or into education. But I always had that in my mind. I want to study law. I want to study law. I want to learn law. And when that opportunity came up, I took it. I took it. It worked out. But if you know that maybe after four years, you won't be able to maybe apply the law, why did you take the risk? What is something that really tells you, okay, first of all, I will leave California. Secondly, maybe this is a great opportunity for me. And you need to pay check anyway. And also, I mean, you need to study. Mm -hmm. you, you, you will yeah. go to study again, yeah. pay the check, coming back to your town. And also, there are no guarantee for nothing. That's how badly I wanted to learn about the law. And I had already decided nothing was going to stop me. If this opportunity happened and I was able to take the bar, it's a win. And I had already decided if, if it doesn't happen, I'll, I'll find a school that will take me. And I'll move my family somewhere. And you know, if I can find a night school and work during the day, that'd be wonderful. If not, you know, I, I was determined. And I think, Jenny Bell, that every last student that attend, attended Garza School of Law had that same determination. It was a, a group of people that wanted to learn the law. You know, it's, you can't say that they wanted to become lawyers because of they're going to make more money because realistically you get into the school you don't know if you're going to become a lawyer but i think everybody wanted to learn the law you know they wanted to know how this works and it happened we were able to take the bar some of us not not everybody in the school got to take the bar the population in Reynaldo garza it most it was most for the rio valley rio uh, grande valley we did have, Jenny Bell, we did have students from Houston. We had students from the Austin area. We had students from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We had a student, I'm not quite sure what it was he did in the Dallas area. I think he was a businessman, had some kind of business. 
he would fly into the valley on a Monday. Classes for us were Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at night. So he would fly into the valley on a Monday, go to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, fly back to Dallas, I guess maybe take care of his business Friday and Saturday, and then fly back Monday. Now, he, he got together with the administration and came up with a plan. Open a branch in Dallas, Fort Worth, in that area, and he did. The school got behind him, they worked it out. They used the charter from our school to open a branch in Dallas, Fort Worth. I remember reading an article in the paper how the very first day of school, when they opened, they opened their doors to, I think it was like 96 brand new law students. Our peak enrollment for first year, second year, third year, and fourth year did not reach 96. So the very first day that he opened the doors, he had more students for first year than we did four years combined. Dallas-Fort Worth School of Law existed for a few years, and then Wesleyan College or Wesleyan University took him in, and they became Wesleyan School of Law. And then a couple of years ago, I don't know if you've read Texas A&M, took in the law school, so it's now A&M School of Law. And it was chartered from Reynaldo T. Garza School of Law. Yeah, but how, I mean, how about the quality of edu education? I mean, as I said, you went to California, coming back to your home, with all your family, take the risk. You told me also that you work in the morning, you work, you study in the morning, work on the night, right? I, I worked during the day. I, worked, uh, yes. I was a teacher. After I came back from Car North Carolina, I came back to teaching, and I was going to school at night. So teach during the day and become a student at night. So what, what I have two questions, step by step. The first question is, what did your family say when you say, no, no, I will leave California, all time. I'm going to the law school there. It's unaccredited, but I don't care. I will do it. What did your family say? My, my wife at the time was very supportive because she knew that's something I had been wanting to do for a long time. And my children were very small. And it was, it was not a real hard decision because I was going to continue working and continue supporting my family and then going to school at night. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a sacrifice in the sense that tuition money had to come out of the bank because since the school was not accredited, there were no student loans available. So we had to pay tuition and we couldn't go get a student loan to pay tuition. There wasn't grants, there was, you know, like you got to pay as you go. But it worked out. What you do, you didn't went to another school. Houston, for example. It would have been a bigger sacrifice. It would have been harder for the family because I would not have left my family behind. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder. It's not so hard when the single person goes off to college. It's a little bit harder when you go off to college and you've got the wife and you've got the child or the children and You've got to go up there and you've got to find a place to live and it's got to be okay for the kids and you've got to find a good school. It, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. It's a lot more difficult. How was your experience in the, the Lo Garza school? I mean, and also there are a lot of debating about the quality of education. And we, we were interviewed by the magazine that comes out for the lawyers in Texas. And I remember telling them, you can 
talk about the quality of education, but the real test is the bar exam. If your education was not good, you're not going to make the bar exam. You have to learn. It, it's kind of like the equalizer. I called it the equalizer. That bar exam is going to equalize a lot of things. You know, the Harvard student, the Harvard law student may pass with a higher grade. Stanford law student may pass with a higher grade, but the state sets the level. Anything below that, you don't become a lawyer. You got to meet the standard that the state sets, and if you meet the standard, you're there. And, you know, the Garza students can get into a courtroom and hold their own against anybody. They've been doing it. So it's it's, it, was a, it was a good education. We had practicing attorneys as, as adjunct professors, and we had law professors that were full-time professors. And the dean would bring in some other professors. We had a professor from Loyola. We had a professor from, I think it was, Michigan School of Michigan Law School, State of Michigan. He came down one summer to teach a class, and it was great. And they were pretty much at the same level, I thought, as the adjunct professors that we had. We had professors that did nothing but personal injury and tort law, so that was the tort professor. We had professors that um, you know, in law you can't say you specialize in this unless you've gone and taken your specialty examination and become certified in family law. But, you know, we had a certified family law professor. We had a certified um, personal injury attorney teaching towards. We had, we had good quality teachers. They, they were just not full-time professors at a, at a big law school. Why do you think never the Texas State uh, system accredit the Garza Law School? What's happening there? Uh, What's happening? When I was there, Jenny Bell, there was efforts were being made. Some of the student body traveled to Austin to lobby the legislature when uh, Pan American was trying. Pan American was trying to bring us in. And it would have been great. If I remember correctly, the problem was that a lot of the tax money at the time for the state of Texas was based on oil and gas production. And oil and gas production had slowed down. There wasn't a lot of money. And I believe that Pan American was asking to be allowed to take the school in, let it be a fully accredited law school, and they could do it if they could get some money from the legislature in the state, and they didn't want to give it because it wasn't really available. The Time, times were tight. The students was, was aware about that, and I imagine that as a student, I mean, you started the first year, the second year, the third year, but when you are r almost done, I mean, the students in some point, uh, the population, the law school, some point think about we are going to protest, we are going to fight with this school. I mean, because it's a lawyer school. So it we, could be a big protest. I don't know. I, I'm thinking, I don't know what is the time, what wasn't the time, but. We all, and, and that's what I think brought the students at Reynaldo G. Garza School of Law together because we all had different lives, different jobs, different everything, but we had a goal, and that was get this law school accredited. And we had that in common, and, you know, we all pushed for it. We would write letters to the legislators. We would write letters to, you know, state officials. We would, we would do whatever we could to, you know, keep it at the forefront. There was there was some 
sentiment in the area against the law school. Um, some attorneys didn't want competition. And here you're gonna have a school graduating potential attorneys. Some businesses at the time, back in the day, Jenny Bell, it was not hard for a business to get sued. You know, if you have a defect on your premises and somebody walks in and trips on the uneven floor and gets hurt, they're gonna get sued. And on the one hand, from the business owner standpoint, like, I don't wanna get sued. On the other hand, it's like, hey, fix your floor. You know, you've got a hazardous condition here. They didn't want to get called on it. So there was a lot of businesses that were pushing back against the law school. There was a lot of politics in favor of it and a lot of politics against it and very little money in the state budget. So we had a visit the first year of graduates the year that they're supposed to graduate. It was a four-year night school program. The first year was in their last year, of their fourth year. They're gonna graduate that May. I believe it was middle of the year. We got a visit from four of the state Supreme Court justices. And they came to visit with us and see what was going on, because everybody had heard about Reynaldo G. Garza School of Law. So four of the Supreme Court justices came to visit, and it was so cool. We went into the library, and the entire student body fit in the library. <laughs> and we had a, just a real relaxed, question and answer session with the justices. And the justices got to see the facilities, they got to see that we had a fairly well stocked library. It had been donated to the school by an oil company. And we had a very well stocked library. At that time, we had what was known as West Law. You could get on a computer and research the law. And the justices were impressed with the library. I think they were impressed with the student body. Um, they got to see that it was a real mix of valley people. You had businessmen, you had educators, you had, you had a little bit of everything. And everybody was very passionate about learning the law. When the justices left, a few days later, the dean let us know that they were gonna send somebody from the character and fitness division. When you apply to go to law school in Texas, you gotta fill out a character and fitness questionnaire. Before you're admitted, they wanna make sure that your character is okay. So, we didn't do that because at the time that we applied to law school, it was not accredited. So they sent the representative from character and fitness to get the forms filled out by each student. And then they let the school know that the next two years, whoever graduated in the next two years would be given a waiver and be able to take the bar. The school, took that and that summer, okay, that year they had the first year of graduates. They all got to take the bar. That summer they offered classes so that you could accelerate. I was scheduled to graduate the following May, which I would have still been within the waiver to take the bar exam, but I wanted to get done. So I. I took summer classes, and instead of graduating the following May, I was able to graduate December. Some of the other students that were gonna graduate after May were also able to accelerate 
and graduate that May. So they kind of made it, gave us the opportunity, or gave the, the ones behind the first two years of graduates, gave them the opportunity to, hey, speed it up and catch up so that you can graduate in May and take the bar. I don't remember exactly how many graduates were able to take advantage of that two-year waiver. Then they came back, I think, and granted another one-year waiver after that. I, I, I can't remember. But I, I read that only the 25% of the students of Garza really pass the Texas bar exam. So I, I don't know the statistics, Jenny Bell. I do know that I had some friends that took the bar once never took it again. Took the bar twice, didn't pass, never went back. They got busy in their careers and realized that they didn't have the time to dedicate to prepare for the bar. The bar exam is not easy. It's not easy from the standpoint that for us, it was a four-year night school you take the bar exam and they're testing you on the first year and they're testing you on the second year and they're testing you on the third year and they're testing you on the fourth year. So you've got to remember what you learned four years ago. And that's why they have bar review courses and you know, you get, but you've got to be able to dedicate the time and the effort. We had people that were working law enforcement raising families. It's not like, okay, well, let me take a month off and get ready for the bar. You can't do it. So some, some of my friends just gave up because they didn't have the time to dedicate to getting ready. But you give up after four years waiting for that? It's the realities of life, Jenny Bell. You've got a wife and you've got two or three or four kids at home and your pay is necessary. It's, it's a sacrifice to say, okay, you know what? We're gonna cut down to two meals a day and uh, I want you to sh shop at the flea market for my kids' clothing and it's, it's a sacrifice. So it's, what do is, what is people do after? Well, um, I mean, they, they worked at their careers, I mean, the friends that I have that didn't go back for the bar exam after the first or second time, they've climbed in their field. They're directors of programs now. They're, they're, they're up there. I mean, they, they used that same energy that they had to go to school. They used it at their job and, and came up. It's, it, was, it was a hard thing for everybody. I think 90 to 95 percent of all the students were full-time employed. About 80 to 85 percent were married with families and they're going to school at night and they're working during the day and it was a sacrifice. It was not an easy thing to do. It, it took a lot out of a lot of people, you know, and I, I, I remember getting it down to a routine. School was Monday through Thursday at night. Friday evening was Peter Piper night for my kids. And we'd take them to Peter Piper and they'd play and they'd you know, have a good time. Saturday morning I would be up by 6.30, 7 o'clock get the lawnmower going, do the yard, clean up. By eight o'clock, I'm at the dining room table with my books, briefing my cases. And that was my Saturday. Saturday from about 8 a.m. straight to about one or two in the morning on Sunday. Getting all my classes, all my cases briefed for all of my classes getting ready for the coming week 
Sunday, it was take the children to visit their grandparents, spend a little family time together, come back and get ready for Monday night. The professors were very demanding. I mean, it wasn't kind of like a, a take it easy time. It, we had professors that would tell you, if you get called on to brief a case and you're not prepared, I'm gonna count you absent for that day. You get three absents in my class, you're out of my class. So it's not like the professors were all understanding and take it easy. They insisted and they demanded and you had to produce. If you didn't, there was gonna be harsh consequences. So work during the day and be ready to go at night. How was, how was, I mean, the community around the Garza School? I mean, people really, the Valley appreciated the creation of the law school and everybody was excited, like you, you see in the general uh, newspaper, I say, wow, there are, a, there are a law school now in my, in my near to my mm -hmm. home, I can do that. I, I can't gauge accurately what the community was, I mean, there was a lot of members of the community that were pro-education and this was a higher education opportunity that they wanted. There was a lot of people that didn't know about it, didn't care about it, you know, didn't pay any attention to it. And then there were some people that didn't want it. So I think it was a, a mixed, mixed feeling all, all across the community. Do you think that the low Garza was located in another part of the state of Texas would be different, the well, situation? I'll, I mean, I'll go back to the school that was created using the Garza Charter, and it was created in, in the Dallas area. It was known as the Dallas-Fort Worth School of Law. Complete success. I mean, it operated as the Dallas-Fort Worth School of Law for two or three or four years. And then Wesleyan College said, we want you. And it became an accredited school under the Wesleyan flag. That one became Texas A&M School of Law. Garza, Garza never took off like that. What's happened? I don't know. I mean. What did you think about, what did you think about me? Maybe, maybe the geographics, maybe, maybe the demographics, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you with certain certainty, Jenny Bell, why this school didn't, but the branch in Dallas-Fort Worth did. It's but did, did you hear about the Lola and Richards cases, which is case which is a, a big case to, to uh, fight for fundings and education in all the border areas, and also your father was a fighter, I think, and I really promote uh, the education, technical education, I mean, our uh, mm -hmm. work for, I mean, the community recognized your father. I mean, you have the family to have been really fight for education. And th there are this Lula case, Richard case, that mm -hmm. is also fight for improved education to the border. Do you think that something related with this? I, I think maybe the timing wasn't there. I, Jenny Bell, we, we were lacking in higher education opportunities in South Texas. I mean, we were, we were underserved. And we kept trying to bring that up. We kept trying to make that known. And I, I think MALDEF got involved with us also trying to push it. And, I mean, it, it's not for a lack of effort. We kept trying to get this school accredited. It, it just didn't work out. It didn't work out. Could you specify what do you mean about the lack of the resources and the schools here and the fundings? And can you describe that? I want to say that at the time that Garza was trying to get established here, we had Pan American, and we had uh, Texas Southmost. 
This is what year, which year do you remember? This was in the mid 80s. I think the highest you could get at Pan Am was a master's in education. And I don't know if Texas South most offered that. Because I think people from Brownsville would go to Edinburgh to work on a master's degree. People from the valley would go north. My dad got a master's degree in education at Sam Houston in Huntsville. He would go up in the summers to take classes and he wouldn't go by himself. He would go with a group of five or six other men that wanted to get a master's and they would go to Sam Houston. This was when I was younger. So even back then, the effort had to be made to pick up and go. Fortunately, you know, Sam Houston State University offered summer courses leading to a master's degree. Took a few summers to get the coursework completed, but that's what they were doing. Could you keep in touch with your graduate classmates from the Garza School? I'm sorry? Did you keep in touch with them? With my classmates? With your classmates? I see them at the courthouse <laughs> all the time. I see them at the courthouse all the time. My dad had been involved in education most of his adult life. The dean made it known that he needed some board members, and I suggested my dad. And my dad became part of the Reynaldo G. Garza's board. When I graduated, my dad handed me my diploma. Oh. It was it was a very you know touching moment for me. I can imagine. Because by the time I graduated, it's like I get to take the bar. <laughs> I knew I was going to get to take the bar. It was it was a good time. Some people was transferred. Some students was transferred to San Antonio. Los Los schools. No, this is no, no, no. Some of the students, Jenny Bell. Gradu well, they didn't graduate, but they were worried that the accreditation process wasn't going to happen, and they already had one or two years of law school classes under their belt, and somebody found a law school, I want to say it was in Michigan, who told them, you come over here, we will honor the credits that you've gotten at Garza. So a group of them picked up and took off to Michigan. I can't remember the name. And they've come back. They're, they're practicing down here. They went to an accredited school that recognized the credits that they had earned at Garza. So. What does what it mean for your father? It was for the board on the board in the Garza School that no, never, I mean, the credit never happened. My, my dad got on the board because I suggested he should get on the board. I thought that he would be able to help the school. And he had some background with the accreditation process, and that's why I wanted him to become part of the school. Maybe my dad could make phone calls with people that he had already met, people that he had already dealt with, and try to push the accreditation for the school. And because he was on the board, he was on the stage to hand me my diploma. <laughs> well, but this has never happened. Your father feels sad. I mean, how, how they do that? It was, it, it, the school just didn't shut the doors and go away after the, after the class graduated. It stayed on, it struggled, it kept trying, it kept pushing. Uh, I want to say, Jenny Bell, that there was another class that was given a waiver. 
and the school kept trying to, you know, make it happen and trying to get the accreditation. But um, the funding, keyword funding, wasn't there. The school could not run just on tuition money, and the funding wasn't there. So the decision was made to shut the doors. And I remember we packed up the library in boxes and sent it to the branch in Dallas-Fort Worth. It's painful. It was, but at the same time, you realize people that are in your very same situation, people that want to learn the law, have an opportunity and also help them out. Why do you think that any company around the valley tried to help with the funding to the Garza? I, I can't answer that. The, the economy was down at the time, Jenny Bill. I want to say that, you know, there was a lot of sentiment in business. Business owners were being sued. You know, because like I said, there's a hazardous condition in your store and somebody walks in and there's an uneven floor and they fall and get hurt. You know, you get sued by a lawyer, all of a sudden, maybe you don't like lawyers. And you get sued again and again. And then you realize, okay, let me fix the floor, but you keep getting sued and you don't like lawyers. So why are you going to be in favor of opening a law school in your backyard. So there was some sentiment. Some people that were pro-education and saw the potential for a law school for the up-and-coming young people to go to, they were for it. It's just that, you know, it's kind of hard to collect money when there's very little of it. Garza was an uh, Anglo uni school, right? The what? Anglo school. I mean, was English? The English was the language that. Oh yeah. But everybody was bilingual. No, not everybody was bilingual. We had, um, we had, quite a few non-Spanish speaking students. Um, I would say the majority were bilingual. You know, Hispanic. And I, I think when the justices came down, I think they may have heard that we were a bunch of militant Mexican-Americans, you know. But, but they soon realized that, no, no, they're not militant Mexican-Americans. And, and they saw the sincere passion that we had to learn the law. I think that's why they, they decided at the Supreme Court level to give us a waiver. And it, I, it worked out. And now there's four Garza grads that are judges in Hidalgo County. Yeah, you are together. Yeah, we're still friends, you know. And, and I've noticed, Jenny Bell, we have at the county court level, not just the Garza grads, but I think the Garza grads, court one, we have Judge Rudy Gonzalez. Court two, we have Judge Jay Palacios. Court three, is a probate court, not a county court. Court four, we have Judge Fred Garza, and court five is Arnoldo Cantu. For a while, we were the only county courts. And then court six was created, and then court seven was created, and then court eight was created, and now we need to create court nine because we have gotten so busy. Hidalgo County has grown so much. But for a while, it was just the four guards of grads taking care of the county courts at law. We have a really good relationship, not just, I think, primarily because we were friends before we became lawyers and before we became judges, but, you know, we've set the tone for the other judges. They all know. if. If you're sick, call any one of us. We're going to take care of your cases for that day. You know, one of our judges a few years ago ended up in the hospital, 
had to have surgery, was out for about three weeks. We did not skip a beat. We did not reset a single case. I'll take care of it today. I'll take care of it tomorrow. I'll take care of it Wednesday. The courts kept running, and that's, that's important because you're supposed to be there for the people, and we work. We all work really well together. After you get your Texas bar <coughs> and become a, a real lawyer, or, I mean, mm -hmm. an you attorney, can, a, licensed an attorney. attorney. Yeah, a license. <coughs> Do you see at some point to leave the valley, to leave this, this world, or do you always think, I want to work here in my... I, I graduated when I was waiting for my bar results. I was clerking for a small firm in Edinburgh. When the bar results came in, um, the small firm at that time couldn't offer me what I could get at the district attorney's office. And I became an assistant district attorney in Hidalgo County. And that job carried the benefits of health insurance for my family, a little bit of retirement, vacation time, sick leave, and that was good. And I, I stayed with the district attorney's office almost two years. And then I went out into the private sector and I joined up with a former judge who did not get reelected. And I started practicing law associated with him. And after a couple of years, almost a couple of years with him, I opened up my own office and I was a solo practitioner in FAR, FAR San Juan Alamo is three little towns, one school district. So I opened up an office in FAR. I was living in Alamo. I practiced out of that office for about 11 years ran for office, and I've been on the bench since '03. When you start to practicing, this has happened when, when we, learn, we are young and graduate or, or, or major and go to the field work, most of the time, this, I didn't, nobody explained to me this in a school. This has happened to you when you start to practice a lawyer stuff, and you say, well, the guards, I mean, I know you, you love the guards school. I mean, mm -hmm. beyond your sentiment, I mean, your, every sentiment that we have when, I mean, I love my university too. Uh, but when you go to the field and the real work, I mean, the real life, did you feel that something was like a, I didn't well, learn this in the school. Nobody well, tell me. When I was in college and getting ready to become an elementary ed teacher, I took classes like teaching math in the elementary, teaching science in the elementary, all these classes that were going to help me teach different subjects to the students. When I did my student teaching, it was like, oh. <laughs> it's kind of the same way when you get a law degree and you take the bar exam and you get your license, and now you're going to be a lawyer. And what helped me a lot, Jenny Bell, was that I had been clerking with a small firm. And these guys, I still see them. I love them to death. But they would take advantage of me. <laughs> <laughs> they, would, they would have a divorce case, for example. And they were too busy getting ready for a trial. They would pick up the phone, call the judge, and say, Judge, uh, we've got a divorce in your court this morning. We've got a law student waiting for his bar results. Is it OK if he shows up for us on our behalf? OK, he'll be there. It's kind of like teaching your kid how to swim by picking him up and throwing him into the deep end of the pool. So that was my baptism. It, I would cover these guys. and. I knew that that's what I had gone to school for. It was a little bit nerve-wracking, a little bit scary,
but you learn real quick. And in Hidalgo County, we have what I like to tell young attorneys, a very helpful bar association. The members of the bar, the attorneys. Jenny Bell, I'll, I'll tell the new attorney, look, if you ever get lost, if you don't know what to do, find somebody that looks like an attorney walking down the hallway, ask them, excuse me, are you an attorney? And if they say yes, ask them. And I guarantee you, 99.9% .9 of those attorneys are going to stop, take a little time, and help you out. That's what we have in Hidalgo County. You may go into the courtroom, and you may be at the point of throwing books at each other, but when you walk out, you'll go drink a cup of coffee together. Because they know it's, you know, it's, it's the bar. And at one time or another, they were there too. They help. They, they really do. And Olo, do you consider that the education, the opportunity that you have for education, and all your family have to for education, is a common opportunity for everybody in this part of the, the, the state? I mean, it was before, and it, or how it's different for now? Do you think that this has improved? Yeah. Je Jenny Bell, I, th I think opportunities have improved. Um, it's easier to get into a student loan. It's easier to get into or find grants. It, the problem is that your personal situation may not be very conducive. If you're married and you've got three kids at home and your husband's working and you're working and you want to go to law school. Okay, if you're living in Hidalgo County, you're going to have to make arrangements. You know, you're going to have to take the LSAT. You're going to have to apply. You're going to have to get accepted. Once you're accepted, you're going to have to sit down with your family and say, okay, look, I've got an acceptance letter from this law school. I want to go. You and the family are going to decide, is it better for me to just go alone and come back home every two or three weeks and then go back, or do I want to move my family? But now it's easier to get the loans, it's easier to find grants, it's, there's, I believe, more programs available that help. You know, it's, it's um, I think it's a little easier. Me, I chose to go to an unaccredited law school and I couldn't get student loans and I, I was teaching and working on the side and trying to, scrape it together, make sure that my kids weren't lacking anything, the house wasn't lacking anything. and It, it was a sacrifice for every last one of the Garza students. I can guarantee you that it was a sacrifice. I can imagine. Do you think that the now there are, this, oh, because this, this has happened in the, in the rural towns and the small towns uh, sometimes, I don't know here, but sometimes it's that there are in the environment this idea that everybody needs to go to the college. In your time, was the idea or this idea was from your family specific? I mean, your neighbors, the people who maybe came with your grandfather, the family from your grandfather that settled in San Juan, mm -hmm. have the same idea to go to the college? Having grown up with a mom and a dad that were educators, I knew by the time I was in elementary school that I was gonna go to college. My dad was going crazy when my senior year I told him, I'll go to college when I get back from Vietnam. And he's like, what? I said, I want to enlist. My dad had been in the military since World War II. First active duty and then reserves and then activated in Korea and then reserves. And I think my dad knew better than I did what he had on his hands. And he tried real hard to keep me from enlisting. Succeeded, because he outsmarted me. <laughs> <laughs> he was good at that. Convinced me to give him one semester at Pan Am. Told me that 
after the first semester, if I didn't like it, he would give me his blessing to enlist. He said, but not the Marines. I want you in the Air Force, because he had been in the Air Force. I said, we can talk about that. So I went and I gave it a good effort the first semester of college. I liked it. I liked it. The draft was still going on. Jenny Bell and I remember being in classes, making friends with some of the guys sitting next to me, and then one day their number came up, and the next day they didn't show up to class. They were told to report. So I was draft eligible for a couple of years, and I got lucky. I, I didn't get drafted because I was liking college. And then they stopped the war in Vietnam. Your father, I mean, was born also in San Juan and was a veteran and also educated and also activist, activist for education. Uh, could you tell me more about that moment uh, for your father? Would you say already work hard, work hard, sorry, work hard, more harder than you? Dad was the youngest in his family. And he was the only child that was born on this side of the river. Yeah. He was the only child of my grandparents that graduated high school. He went to UT and was in the ROTC. When the war broke out, he enlisted. Jenny Bell, I want to say that I remember my mother telling me that when my dad enlisted, he was one year short of graduating from UT in Austin. But he enlisted and <clears throat> saw, saw action in World War II in Europe, came back. Married my mom, wanted to go to Pan Am, and the story that I remember hearing from my mom was that Pan Am would not give him credit for any of the classes that he had taken at UT. And he couldn't go back to UT because he was married, started having a family. So he had to start from scratch at Pan Am. So you started again? That's, that's what I remember hearing from my mom, and I'm like, it didn't surprise me that he would do something like that, because my dad was very goal-oriented. He's going to see it through. It's going to get done. He was like that. Let's focus. And all this example, you gave this example. Also your family, your brothers and your sister, all of my brothers and sisters are educated. Um, my older sister is a researcher at the Smithsonian in Washington. Mm -hmm. My younger sister is now <clears throat> retired. She was a probation officer. My brother after my younger sister is a, a doctor. The brother under him was the one that would take care of the family farming and ranching and he became a realtor. And then my youngest brother is a federal agent. So we're all freestanding, you know, standing on our own two feet. And that's what they wanted, you know, just. And know that you work for the community, it, because the thing that you're doing, do you see some cases in your course? Have you seen some cases in your course that in some point you say, well, this guy is like me in some moment, and maybe this guy is lost? Um, when you see all the cases happening around your court, uh, you see your community at some point. You see your community. I, Jenny Bell, I, I, I have tried to redirect thousands of young people. And what I mean by redirecting, I see, I see where they're losing their grip. 
They want to hang out with their little friends. They want to have a good time. They drop out of school. They get into this rut of hanging out with their little friends till two or three in the morning, and then they come home to grandma's house because they're living with grandma or mom's house because they're living with mom. And, and they sleep all day long, get up in the afternoon, eat something, and find their friends to hang out till two or three in the morning. So I have, not all of my cases are young people. You know, I, I get them all ages, but the young ones, I take a little time, start asking them questions. How old are you? 19 or 20. And I ask them, did you graduate high school? No. How far did you get? Uh, 10th grade or 9th grade or 11th grade. Why did you drop out? Or did the school ask you to leave? Because sometimes they're expelled, you know, for their behavior. And, you know, I'll get a response like, um, I have to go work. Really? To help your family? The next question is, how long has it been since you had a job? Uh, a year, or two years, and it's like, so you left school to work, but you're not working. Invariably, what I will do, Jenny Bell, is order them back to school. I order them to finish a GED during their probation. And it's a wonderful way of coercing them back to school. You don't go back to school, you violate my probation order. You violate my probation order, I put you back in jail. So you want to go to jail or you want to go to school? I'll go to school. Boom. I've done it thousands of times. I, I cannot revoke them if they don't pass the GED because now I'm punishing them for a lack of intellect, but if they don't show me an effort of getting back into school, I tell them, you're going to see me again, and, and you're not going to like it. It's not going to be good. You understand? So, back to school. You see, I'm kind of like my dad. I'm pushing education. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think that there are disparities still for education in the, in the borders area? Disparities in not only in sources and funding, like when you study, you, you told me already people have the, the opportunity to get loans, to get scholarships, but I don't know if, if we are still, after all this effort from your father, after all the Garza School effort also, and in cases like this, um, I don't know if the border area is still, uh, there are disparities in education and problems with the fundings and a school that is fighting. Jenny Bell, it, it's, it's hard to say. I like to think that we have the opportunities now. What I see a lot is a lack of young people wanting to take advantage of the opportunities. Other countries, you have to pay to go to school. You don't pay in this country. It's funded by tax dollars. You, you kind of do pay, but you know they, they get their funding not directly. The student doesn't show up to school and say, here's my check. You know, They get a public education. I think aside from having that, a very important resource is mom and dad. If mom and dad are not pushing for the education, you know, kids want to play. Kids at all ages want to play. Sit down and study, sit down and listen. And, you know, they have to know you're going to go to school and you're going to go to school for a purpose. And I'm going to set the goals and you're going to achieve those goals. I, I think parents need to be more demanding. I, everybody's different, you know. Do you have children? No. Yes. Everybody's going to raise their children differently. But I think that what we need to understand is that we as parents have to demand 
and insist on a proper education for the kids. It used to be that you could go to high school and you could get a good job and raise your family based on that job that you got after high school a couple of generations ago. You were big stuff if you went to college. Now, you go to college and you need to get a master's if you want to really climb and then, you know, PhD, doctorates. It's, it's, it's up to the individual. You know, I, I grew up thinking, you got to go to college. And I tell a story. When I was married and going to law school, my then wife and my kids were, you know, living in a small house. Friday night had become Peter Piper night. My kids loved Peter Piper. They loved it. But we're getting ready to go to Peter Piper. And my wife notices that there's a drip from the refrigerator. And the freezer part is thawing out. And emergency, you know, you can't let the freezer thaw out. So I started going through the yellow pages looking for somebody to come and make a house call. And it was Friday and it was about 7, 6.30, 7 p.m. I found a number that was not, it, it was within the school district, so I knew this guy wasn't too far away. And I called him, gave him the address, and he said, I can be there in 15 minutes. I said, okay. Pulls up in a company van. He's 23, 24 years old. Got his wife with him. She's eating pizza. It's like, that's where we're going. This young man gets down, looks at my refrigerator, says, it needs this part, and I've got it in the van. He grabs it from the van, puts it on, fixes my, my refrigerator. Took him 20 minutes, cost me $80. I'm talking to him. He says, yeah, I made the house call because my five other bands are making calls tonight. He was the owner of the company, 22, 23 years old. He charged me 80 bucks for about 20 minutes worth of work, and he's got five other bands doing the same thing. And I'm like, he didn't go to college, and he's doing well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for the motivation, too. You know? Okay. So, okay, go back to say, okay, querer es poder, this is most, most of the example. Um, but your daughters are two educators now. What do, you, what do you think that they think about the education? My, uh, my younger daughter and my younger son are educators. My older daughter and my older son became an attorneys. I tried to talk to them about going to law school, and they love what they do. They love being in, in the education field. They love helping young people get the basics to help them succeed. And <clears throat> they couldn't think of doing anything else. My older daughter has a job with the Attorney General's office, and it's, it's on a contract basis. She has a little girl, five, and twins that are about three and a half, married to an attorney. So my son-in-law is an attorney, and my daughter is an attorney. And on this contract basis, she gets to work as little as 20 hours a week or as many as 40 hours a week. And she loves it. She can be an attorney during the morning part of the day and a mommy in the afternoon part of the day. So um, she doesn't want to quit. She doesn't want to be 
a full-time mom. And the kids are starting to grow and they're in their little school and she'll take them to school in the morning and go work half a day and then pick them up and take them home and spend the rest of the day with them. And I'll call her up every once in a while, you're making dinner? <laughs> <laughs> And Nolo, would you like to add something about all this experience of Garza Law School or something that I maybe not cover in all this conversation about all your life and your education and the border stuff? And would you like to add something else? Well, Jenny Bell, I, I, I like to think back to the days and the sacrifices that everybody made, um, the risks that we took, all in the interest of learning the law, it, it paid off for some of us in the sense that we were able to take the bar exam and, and become licensed attorneys. Some of the students didn't get that opportunity. And it's sad, you know, it's sad. Pan American wanted us. They could have established the law school, but the legislature didn't have the funding for it, so it didn't happen. I, I think educational opportunities have improved down here. Now we just need to get our young people to take advantage of it. So. Yeah, I have another question. Why did you think it's important to have oral history projects in South Texas, and why did you accept to interview for this project? I accepted the interview for this project because I think it's important that we know what things were like, that we remember what things were like, and keep moving forward to improve educational opportunities, not just in South Texas, but in the state, in the entire state. And it, it doesn't have to be necessarily higher education. Like I said, there's a lot of students that don't want to go to college. When I was in high school, Jenny Bell, we had vocational classes available. You could learn to be an auto mechanic, you could learn auto body repair, you could learn certain vocations that would enable you after high school to get a job. I, I believe they did away with those vocational classes and now there's vocational schools. But it's all about providing the opportunity for the young person. If he doesn't want to be an attorney and if he doesn't want to be a doctor and he wants to be, for example, an auto mechanic because that's what he likes, provide that opportunity. And if it's gonna cost money, provide the loans, provide the funding, provide the means for him to get there. I. I tell some of the young people in front of me that have not gotten a job, they've already graduated high school and they've been kind of like spinning their wheels for a year or two, not really working, and they commit an offense and I put them on probation. Hidalgo County Probation has a really good program. They've expanded what they offer and I tell them. I tell them, if it's a young man, I tell them the story about the young man that had come before me asking for authority to leave Hidalgo County. When you're on probation, you're in Hidalgo County. And I tell them about the opportunities available through the probation department. They have a plumbing assistant school, electrical assistant school, nursing assistant, phlebotomist, and I'll ask them, you know what a phlebotomist is? When you go to the hospital and they need a blood sample, the phlebotomist is the one that takes it out. That's a phlebotomist. They have welding school. 
and I tell them the story about the young man that wanted authority to leave Hidalgo County because through the probation department, he had gone to welding class and gotten certified as a welder. And he had a job in Houston waiting for him that paid $28 an hour, all because he was on probation and took advantage of the welding class. And then I tell him, and every once in a while, there's monies available where, where they will cover your tuition. What's it gonna cost you to go learn to be a welder? If that's what interests you, I'm providing opportunities and trying to make them understand you can't go through life being a party boy. You know, it's gonna come to where your grandma not gonna feed you. She's not gonna provide a roof over your head. She's not gonna let you use her electricity anymore. You gotta stand on your own two feet. Try to make them understand that. Oh, I have another question here. Do you, what did you think that nobody, nobody but in some point, I mean, we read that UT, UT absorb with Pan American. I mean, Pan American don't merge with the law school Garza because was the UT law school. But it's not the same because the UT law is in Austin. In Austin. And they've, they've been talking about, if I remember right, I think they've gotten programs, Jenny Bell, where if you want to go to medical school, they have like a co-op program down here. They were talking about having a co-op law school down here where you you take maybe your first year down here or your first two years down here and then transfer over there. I, I don't know why they decided against it, but it didn't happen. But they're talking about it. And, and as long as they're talking about it and pushing for it, maybe it will happen. Maybe it will happen. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Arnoldo. Thank you for your time. Jenny Bill, thank for you your for your patience. It was a pleasure.